So the first first thing we were asking everybody to do is to introduce themselves. Yeah. We may not make it to the air. Right. But we may choose to do that. Sure, sure. So if you if you know who you are, when you graduated, and what you did at the convention. My name is David Stewart, um, class of 1996, and I was chairman of the uh, 96 mock convention. Uh, David Stewart, class of 1996, and I was the chairman of the uh, 96 mock convention. Good. Okay, tell me about the 96 mock convention, and then I'm going to ask questions based on what you tell me. Okay. Well, the timing that we had was, was pretty uh, unique. We were right before the South Carolina primary, which ended up tipping the entire race. And so we had, from a timing standpoint, um, a great draw because there was a great deal of attention on what we did. Um, as well as um, a lot of pressure on us to get this right because whether South Carolina went for Pat Buchanan or Bob Dole largely was going to depend um, or determine how the race would uh, end up. Okay, and how did it wind up? Well, it ended up that we correctly picked uh, Bob Dole and he was uh, nominated um, and we were able to uh, continue the streak. How hard was it to uh, pick him? It, it was pretty tough because you know, we had a candidate who everybody expected to win, but had not performed as expected um, on the front end. And you were going into a state with South Carolina where you had a very conservative voter base and you had Pat Buchanan who was really um, hitting into uh, that vein of the party. And so it was a uh, very difficult call to make on uh, which way to, uh, to go. Remind people that the mock convention at one point was in May then April, yours were, it was in March, and now it's in January. Right. What's the deal with the timing of the convention? How, you know, it's, it's, it's timing during the calendar. Sure, I, I think that, you know, we've seen the evolution of the timing as we've seen the primary process move forward and in an attempt to remain relevant. I mean, at its, at its heart, you know, it's a research um, project um, that uh, invo just happens to involve an entire student body and um, lots of parties and other things like that associated with it. And so, you know, in an attempt to, to remain relevant, you've seen the uh, convention move increasingly um, earlier so that it can have its true predictive um, function rather than um, really being a fait accompli of what has already occurred. And, and sometimes they get it wrong. Right, yeah. You know, yeah, is absolutely. That it is, there's no guarantee you're going to get it. Right, absolutely. And I think that that's one of the things that, you know, even in this age where the information is much more readily accessible, you know, it's still very difficult um, to make these calls because you've got, um, you can have insurgency, insurgent candidates like you had with President Obama. You can have different things that are very difficult um, to really see how it will play out throughout a, a primary process. How many years of ex uh, preparation did you have to go through when you came to WNL as a freshman? Did you say, hey, I want to be the chairman? No. You know, when I, when I came there, um, I served on the executive committee first year, and then we had uh, somebody that I knew was one of the three trustees um, who uh, was slated to pick the leadership for the next mock convention. And I'd always been interested in politics. It was something that I knew was around, but I really didn't know the extent um, of it until I started talking to him and really got um, interested in it. We started working on it the middle of our sophomore year, so it was a two-year plus uh, commitment. Okay. Tell me about the, your, your fellow chairman. Do you, do you keep up with them? What, what was it like working with them and, and, and has that led to anything else? Well, we, we do keep up. I think that it was you know, truly a case of you know, having remarkable people around you so that all I had to do was go, really go stay. And, and, and because we're not going to hear my Sure. Okay. So I, I keep up with my friend, oh, yeah. fellow chairman. Yeah. Well, we actually don't keep up that great. So I'll probably just say that we. Right. Yeah. I, I can just. Yeah. Yeah. Or I've, yeah. You know, right. yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, there was a there was a great bond formed between the three of us who were the the tri chairs, and I think that it was really um, for me one of the first examples of really just trying to have talented people around you and getting out of the way. Um, we had Courtney Tucker with her maiden name who was uh, our personnel chairperson and she kept um, the political chair Bob Ross and I in line. She was the uh, one who kept everything going and really made sure that we had the uh, right things in, uh, in place and we uh, had the right people working on the right things and then um, Bob did a great job with the uh, political shop and getting all the uh, speakers lined up, getting the prediction right. Um, and then I could just uh, sit back and, uh, you know, put my feet up on the desk and enjoy it. So 
So the 96 convention was the first convention that I remember um, that was broadcast nationwide. When did you learn about that and what difference did it make? I think that we learned about it probably about a month out that C-SPAN was going to carry a portion of it live. And so um, we were thrilled. I mean, it was something that we frankly thought was a Hail Mary. Um, we, we had several Hail Marys that year. I mean, we ended up getting Speaker Gingrich, which we didn't think that we would be able to do. Um, we had Vice President Quayle come in and a few other um, people that we really thought were stretches and that we weren't sure that we would be able to, uh, to get them. But once C-SPAN announced, it really seemed to uh, excite the committee, excited the student body. Um, and I think you kind of saw it in the reaction, especially the first evening session when uh, we went live for the first time. And, and, and to tell me a little bit more about being live versus uh, starting whenever you want. Well, you know, I, I recall that we had this great countdown that we had to do, and um, this was the uh, end of the first day, and um, I think in true WNL and mock convention fashion, there had been plenty of uh, parties throughout the afternoon, and so we had to make sure that folks were in their seats and uh, ready to go uh, when uh, we went live. I think it was probably around 7 o'clock Eastern or so. And so throughout the day, we uh, were telling people to be there. And um, again, true WNL fashion, everybody was there. And uh, kind of like a night game for football, everybody was uh, very excited and uh, rowdy and ready for it to, uh, to begin. Good. Um, tell me more. Um, go ahead. And yeah. Hold your hands like we can't see them. But yeah. Tell me more about the speakers. You got the former vice president, you got the speaker of the house. How did you do? That? Well, you know, it's interesting. I mean, with the speaker of the house, um, we worked on that for probably close to a year. I mean, we pulled every connection possible to try to get Speaker Gingrich um, there, and we had great alumni support. Um, we had just people through parents, other people that had any relationship. We had. Um, former speakers, other people reach out to him, um, and given the demands on his time, you know, we just weren't sure if that would work out. And so we were able to get him, um, and uh, you know, I remember everybody was uh, thrilled once we had that announcement. We also had former Vice President Quayle, we had Haley Barber, who was the chairman of the RNC at the time, we had Bill Bennett, um, we had Tom DeLay, who at the time was really a little known congressman from Texas, um, almost somebody that was uh, an afterthought when we. Uh, put the uh, agenda together, but ended up, um, of course, rising to number two and being very uh, influential in the Republican Party. Um, we had Senator Warner, um, a WNL grad, and you know, that was an especially, um, of all the speakers, having um, him there and you know, just everything that he represents um, as far as the values of WNL and um, being there um, was something that we were very excited about. Let's, let's go ahead and get, get another soundbite on Senator Warner sure. because we have him standing in front of the Capitol saying, you know, the mock convention, right. you know, it's, yeah. it's good stuff. Yeah. Um, so if you can, because, and he also mentions that he spoke twice, and I think that was the second yeah. time. Maybe that was the first time. No, that was the second time. He spoke in the 80s, I believe. I believe. Yeah. That, that was mine, correct. Yeah. Correct, okay. Um, so, yeah, let's, so let's explore Senator Warner. You know, I was thrilled that Senator Warner. Right. And, and he was, you know, big wig senator yeah. then, for sure. Yeah. We were thrilled that Senator Warner accepted our invitation. This was the second time um, that he spoke, and he has always been somebody that um, held WNL in such high regard and really was somebody that was a champion for the mock convention. You would hear stories of him telling his colleagues about how great of an event it was. And so seeing him there and being in that environment and just delivering a speech that really embodied the values of WNL and just being a true statesman. Um, was something uh, that really uh, set a great tone for the convention. Perfect. Perfect. Um, anything about the parade of consequence? I, I wasn't know. there, and I don't remember. Yeah. yeah I mean, Nobody got in trouble, so I think that would be the yeah. notable thing. So one of the parades had an elephant. Was it right. '96? I think was we. I think anything? we may. I think we may have, but I can't really remember. Yeah. We'll go there. I, I have pictures. Of, I yeah. Have pictures of it. But yeah. And I do have some good things about what Quayle said and all that about his experience that would be let's, let's good. Let's talk about that. Is that good? Talk yeah. about Quayle or Gingrich, what you remember, yeah, yeah. Why, why those were important. Yeah. Um, a lot of people don't know. I mean, right. We know. But yeah. So, yeah. Why was it important to Yeah. Well, you know, I think one of, the, one of the highlights was in the evening on our first session, Vice President Quayle spoke, and he had drafted this speech where he knew uh, the audience that he had, he knew the uh, 
mindset of the audience, I guess would be a polite way to uh, put it, and delivered this red meat speech um, that after the fact his speechwriter said that the only time that he had received that good of a, result, of a response was at Texas A&M a week before the 92 election. And so it was something that uh, he hit out of the ballpark and uh, the students were uh, glad to uh, participate. Okay, and uh, Speaker Gingrich. Yeah, Speaker Gingrich gave a great speech. It was at the height of his power and it was where the entire nation really was looking to see um, what his future was, what the future of the Republican Party was. I mean, here you had the first Republican speaker in a very long time um, and you had this great kind of dichotomy between Speaker Gingrich and President Clinton. Um, and he was seen as kind of the intellectual, as well as the political leader of the party. Um, and I think we've seen um, his staying power. I know that Speaker Gingrich has come back um, to speak. And we had several other people who were at the 96 convention who have come back. And so you know, I think it shows the relevance um, and um, the uh, ongoing legacy of those uh, particular speakers. Predicted Bob Dole, and he came back in 2000. Were you there for t at 2000? I was. Yes. Try to try to t t talk about nominating him in '96, and then coming back in 2000. Well, the the thing that I remember most about '96 was once we knew that we were going to nominate him, we had this furious effort to try to. Tell us Bob Dole. Oh, sorry. Yes. Tell us Bob Dole. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Once we knew that we were going to uh, nominate Senator Dole, um, we had this furious effort going on trying to connect with him on the Saturday that we nominated him. And we finally were able to connect and got him on a uh, cell phone before he was leaving on a private plane and he accepted it live, um, which was great. And so it took a great uh, effort to do that. And then it was great coming back for the 2000 convention, really to be able to see it in a whole different light. I mean, the 96 convention was such a blur from, um, you know, organizing it to the long nights. And so it was very nice to uh, see some other people up there uh, sweating and seeing Speaker Dole come back and um, deliver a great speech and, uh, you know, get to uh, experience in a very different way. So you finally got to relax and have I a did. Time. Yeah, I did. I did. After the fact. Have you been to any other conventions besides the 2000. No, that's the only one. But I think my wife and I have talked about bringing our kids uh, once they get older up there and uh, letting them experience it as well. Fair enough. Um, speaking of kids, tell, tell me about the, the, the value or meaning that the MaCon has for you personally. Sure. And then um, another video we're doing is for students. Right. And just you can generalize. You know, it's, it means me, this to me as a, you know, right. when I was there as right. an alum. And, and, and I think it's a good idea for students. Uh, you can either go into it or I can you know, point blank ask. Um, okay. Yeah. You, you either, you either say something nice okay. for, for sure. future generations. Yeah, yeah. And some of, the, some of, that, some of that's going to be for uh, students who, who may be applying. Yeah. Uh, and, and or students that are actually. Sure. Applying. So start with your sure. personal. Yeah. Uh, the, the value or the meaning that you personally got out of the market? Uh, you know, it was the most meaningful thing that I did in my four years. Um, I had the pleasure of serving on the EC and doing other things. But, you know, as far as just the overall embodiment of the WNL experience, I don't think that there was anything else on campus that came close to it. I mean, we had the student autonomy. I mean, it was remarkable um, the amount of um, authority uh, that the administration gave us. We had all the support that we needed from them, but they let us run the show and it was truly student-led, which I think would be um, very rare in, in most places. I think it was also at its heart, you know, a great academic exercise. I mean, this is something that people put in, you know, two plus years on. It was a great, for me, really the first opportunity um, to kind of learn the importance of getting out of the way when you have talented people around you and just let them do um, what they do best. And then, you know, I think like a lot of things at WNL, it mixes the uh, academic with the uh, fun fairly well. And so, you know, it was a highly uh, enjoyable experience. I mean, I recall getting up at 6 a.m. to get ready for uh, the Saturday session and my roommate was heading to a party at the same time. So that seemed uh, pretty fitting. And then uh, give, give a plea to your fellow students um, or current students and and or uh, future students. Sure. Actually, let, let, let's do it. And, and I do have one other thing. Students, sure. Uh, 
And I did have one other thought on that. You know, I think the, uh, another thing that distinguishes the Mott Convention is, you know, we're increasingly living in a country that's polarized. We're increasingly seeing instances where um, universities, you have speakers come, and regardless of what their political ideology is, people on the other side tend to demonize them, protest. You know, I think one of the great things about the Mott Convention is that every four years you have the entire student body join in an effort and become whatever party happens to be celebrating the Mott Convention, regardless of what their political views are. And I think that that's something rare, and I'm not sure um, how many, if, if any, other schools um, you know, in the U.S. that you could have such an experience. Excellent. Very good. You've got kids. Yes. Let's do the plea to the future generation. Why is the Mock Convention important for the future generation? I think it's important for the future generation for a couple reasons. I think the first is that increasingly as we see this country divided along partisan lines, that you have this civility um, that permeates the Mott Convention that I think also is present at WNL that you don't see in a lot of places. This is somewhere, this is an event where regardless of one's personal political ideology, they join in the event and they participate regardless of what they may think about the candidates who are there. And they do so in a very civil um, way. It's also something that is a great academic exercise, but very fun. And it's very difficult to describe it until you kind of see it. But I think as you talk to alums and they talk about um, what are some of their most meaningful experiences, it's always near the top. And it's something that you can't get anywhere but WNL. Perfect. Okay, and then a, a plea to current students. Why should they get involved if they see this video this year? If you're a current student, I think that you should take every opportunity to do as much as you possibly can with WNL. I think, or excuse me, let me, let me start back. Um, if you're a current student, I think you should do as much as possible with mock convention that you can. I think as you talk to students who are very active in it, they will tell you that it was one of the most rewarding experiences that they had. And then I think if you talk to some students who weren't as active in it, you often hear that they wish that they had been more active. And one of the great things about mock convention is that you can be involved in so many different ways. It can be um, from something that will take multiple years and many, many hours. It can also be something that just takes a few days. But however you decide to participate, please participate because the whole process is really predicated upon the entire student body getting into it and uh, putting on uh, what is the most unique exercise of its kind in the, uh, in the country. Good. This time, do, do some of that to the camera. Okay, sure. Start, start with me. I think it's, and then look right into the camera. Okay, sure. Because when you address the students, yeah. they're, they're in the camera. Yeah. And, and you can make it short and sweet. Sure. That, what you just said was perfect. You can right. either say it again to sure. the camera or short. Enough. Okay. So, um, so we're talking about current students. Sure. Should a current student get involved? I think any current student should get involved in the mock convention because I think as you talk to people who graduated from the school, that they will tell you that involvement in the mock convention was one of the most meaningful things that they did in their four years. I think you will see that they found it to be something that was highly rewarding regardless of their level of involvement. And I think that that's one of the uh, great things about the mock convention is that it can be something that you can devote multiple years to, you can devote thousands of hours to, or it can be something that you just attend the event, that you join a delegation, um, that you do things that may be more limited, but all of it goes toward putting on uh, what is the most unique event of its kind in the country. Perfect. Perfect. Another video we're doing yes. is for speakers. Right. Now, you, you seem to have snagged some of the best speakers. Yeah. Professor McConnell right. hinted at that when we interviewed him. Yeah. Um, so this video is is specifically for speakers. Why would you as a speaker, a, a, either a rising politician, or right. already a big name, Dan Quill, Newt Gingrich, yeah. I don't think Hillary Clinton will show up. Right. Well, actually she won't show up in her suburb. Right. It would be a Republican. Um, why, should they, why should they come to Lexington um, for the market? And you can start um, by talking to me, but if you think that you're addressing the speaker, yeah. again, look into the camera. Okay. So this is like the, the, yeah. the, the, the sports commentators sure. talking amongst themselves, yeah. but every once in a while, they'll look into the camera right. to include the person yeah. uh, viewing. 
If I were a prospective speaker, I would come to Lexington and WNL for the mock convention because it is the most unique event of its kind in the country. I think, first off, it is an affirmation of what is great about higher education. Um, here you have this academic experience where you have citizens and students from all across this country who put aside their personal political beliefs to join in this exercise where they reenact a convention for the party that's out of power which is unparalleled and unmatched anywhere in this country. I think the other part of it that you have is that when you speak to any speaker who's ever been to this event before, you find uniformly that it was one of the most rewarding events that they have ever been to. It is something that allows for intelligent discourse. It also allows a great platform for speakers to get their ideas out to the young people of this country. We've had numerous people who have come to speak who have gone on to become president. We've had numerous people who've come to speak, who've come back, which we think is a great testament to the event and to its power across the country. And finally, it's something that the country looks to. It is the most accurate predictor of who the nominee will be. And so the country's eyes will be on Lexington whenever the event is, and we hope that you'll join us for it. Perfect, perfect. Tell me about your experience uh, traveling abroad where somebody came up to you and said, hey, don't I know you? Well, I, I think I've come to the conclusion that either um, a lot of people I know are closet C-SPAN watchers or uh, we just ended up lucking out. I, with the event being live, um, and I did tend to probably get a little uh, overexcited, uh, to put it mildly, during the event. Um, I had numerous people that I knew, and actually um, there were three of us who were traveling in Europe, all of whom were involved in the mock convention. We had somebody stop us while we were in uh, Florence and ask, you know, we, they, we had our WNL shirts on and they had recognized it from the event. So it was something that um, was remarkable, the number of people that just happened to be uh, flipping or that actually watch C-SPAN all the time and are just, you know, embarrassed to admit it. That is too funny. Um, any other stories? I'm trying to think. Um, that could be anecdotal, backstage stuff. It was fun when we did this. It was, uh, you know. I mean, I know Haley Barber made, I forgot, it's either Barber or Bennett. I think it was Barber, but one of the guys that was in my fraternity had gotten him to the house and he was joking about Oh, no, I know. We, we had taken the couches from the SAE house and brought them over to the waiter room, and Haley Barber made a joke about not wanting to feel behind the cushions, uh, you know, while he was in the uh, green room. So, um, so I'm trying to think of uh, anything. Uh, we didn't have, you know, I don't know if the 88 folks talked about, you know, Clinton going out to Zolman's and playing the uh, saxophone and all of that. We didn't have any, uh, any good stories like that from ours. So... Um, I, th I think that that's it. I can't really think of any other kind of big stories. That's fine. Any, anything else that we should stick on here? We really make, make sure I've talked about it all. I think we have. Roundabout, we didn't go in order, but that's fine. I think that was everything that I had uh, yeah. kind of down, if there's... No, that's, that's, that's all I've got. Okay. Well, super. Okay, great. Thank no, you. thank you.